dearly beloved, hear the Holy Gospel of St. Mark, which says, They brought young children to Jesus that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child does, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. We can never sufficiently thank God that he has made baptism a means whereby he works in little children with his grace, turning their hearts to faith, cleansing away their sin, and receiving them into his kingdom. So it is right we should hear in the sight of God, employ this blessed sacrament in the fear of God and with sincere devotion. In order to ask the blessing of our Lord upon this child, let us rise and pray. Almighty and most merciful God, whose promises are unto us and to our children, we heartily pray thee to look upon this child with thy tender mercy. Renew him by thy Holy Spirit in the sacrament of baptism, that he may be thy child and an heir of everlasting life. And let us confess together the holy Christian faith into which this babe is baptized. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> Daniel Walker Black, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given thee the new birth through water and the Spirit, strengthen thee with his grace unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. <laughs> I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, 
announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Our Sunday study of the book of Revelation continues today in chapter 2. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Seven times, like the pealing of a bell, the words ring out in this first, second chapter, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Fascinating thing is, it isn't what you say about the church, or what I think about the church. But what the Spirit says about the church which he created. And there are seven of them. The church in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There is a customized message for each one of the seven. A particular message for the people who live in that place. But there is also a pattern that they all have in common. A word of commendation, followed by a word of correction, followed by a word of motivation. The church is the place where you hear what you're doing right. That's commendation. The church is the place where you hear what you're doing wrong. That's correction. The church is the place where you hear the great promises of God. That's motivation. And we need all three. Commendation, correction, and motivation. There are parts of our lives that are going well. And we should build on it. There are parts of our lives that are not going so well. And we need to correct them. And we need motivation. For Christians are in it for the long haul. And we need something to sustain us through all the dark valleys and barren stretches that are part of every pilgrim's journey. There was much to commend in the church of Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit was lavish in his praise of their hard work, patient endurance, and vigilance against the wolves in sheep's clothing. But there was also this strange word of correction. Strange, because I don't think you would have noticed it. And neither would I. At least, not right away. But the Lord saw it at once. Their hard work, enduring patience, vigilance, were like pearls on a string. But you ain't going to have those pearls very long if the string rots away. I have this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You remember your first love? There's nothing so sung about, it, so storied in prose and poetry as the first love. 
Nothing so pure and passionate, fierce and tender, heartwarming, worth dying for, of eyes and arms and heart as first love. Young people will tell you they're meant for each other because this thing is bigger than both of us. I believe it. Love makes the world go round, we say. And that's true. Only we didn't say it first. God did. Years ago, we had a teacher who was a sports fanatic. And he went through life like it was a boy's locker room. Boorish and ill-mannered. And then one day, something happened as if a fairy godmother had touched him with her wand. He became courteous to his co-worker, cheerful and patient with his slower students. He opened doors for other people, shoveled off the neighbor's wall. And whereas formerly, he always out-fumbled everybody to find his billfold in a restaurant. He actually picked up the tab once or twice. What happened was, he fell in love with one of the younger teachers. The effect was transforming. It changed his entire life. What he never dreamed of doing before <laughs> was now a pure joy to him. When the Spirit speaks about first love, is he talking about our first love for God or our first love for one another? What difference does it make? The Bible from beginning to end is a love story. In the Old Testament, God likens himself to a bridegroom and compares his church to his bride. And when we're fickle and unfaithful, he calls that adultery, whoredom. The entire law of Moses can be capsulized in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. St. Paul distilled it even further and said, Love is the fulfilling of the law. The old Bible word for love is charity. Comes from the Latin word for the heart. Caritas. Love from the heart. And after a lifetime, Paul summed up the experience in this beautiful line. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Love from the heart. A lady told me, that when I visited their home, they were right in the middle of a first-class family row. I'd have never guessed it. They were so charming, <laughs> hospitable. And the minute you left, she said, the argument continued right where it left off. I believe that. That happens in marriages a lot. All the, the externals remain. Words are spoken, meals are served, the garbage is taken out, bills are paid. But boy, can I love go out of it. And all that elegant furniture stands there like tombstones. Monuments 
to a first love lost. And that happens in churches the same way. Jesus says that the identifying mark of a church is this. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples because you love one another. Now, love is the standard by which Christ judges us. And love is the standard by which the world has every right to judge us. So don't be impressed by church buildings and budgets, and ministers that minister, congregations that congregate, and organizations that organize. <coughs> you look for the love. Well, <laughs> how does one recover a lost love? Three things. Remember? the height from which you are fallen. Repent and do what you did at first. Remember. Think about it. Can you recall the day when you really loved Jesus who first loved you? How warmed and enthralled you were by Jesus who forgives sins, dries tears, lifts burdens, heals the sick, raises the fallen from the dust of the sea, and restores hope in those who have lost all hope. Remember and then repent. Repent means saying no to yourself and yes to God. In Bible language, repent means deny yourself. Die to yourself so that you can rise up an entirely new creature in a new kind of life by the same power that raised up Christ from the dead. You believe that? A young couple came to the house to put the finishing touches on their wedding plans. And as they were leaving, the groom-to-be blurts this out. I'm scared to death of all of this. Which certainly got his fiancée's attention. No, honey, I'm not afraid of marrying you, he explained. I'm afraid of losing you. His parents had recently died. Then his older brother in a car accident. And he was so overwhelmed with grief, he said, that he couldn't stand it if he were to lose her too. He wanted me to reassure them that they were young and healthy and had nothing to worry about. But I couldn't tell them that because I don't know that. I buried too many young people. In my experience, 100% of all marriages come to an end. Sometimes tragically, through divorce or untimely death. And some marriages last 50, 60 years. And if you're in one of them, you'll probably love each other more than you did at the start, but it's still going to end. And it will be harder then for you to say goodbye than it was at the beginning. So, 
give her up today get the funeral get the grieving out of the way die to your right to have her die to your fear of losing her die to the myth that you can keep her and once you do that you won't be afraid anymore because you can't scare dead people and then let God give her back to you every moment of every new day that doesn't spoil your life it enhances it anybody who's been to the edge will tell you you come back more aware more alive more grateful for the mercies of each day seize the moment while you have it here and now remember repent and do the things you first did in the funny how doing trains your thinking if you train yourself to do a good job in the kitchen the classroom the construction site you aren't satisfied anymore with doing a lousy job so do it say your prayer love each other and be convinced that you're doing the good thing the right thing the blessed thing remember repent and do Amen. the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus Amen
Christ the same night in which he was betrayed to prayer. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup and he had supped. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Thank you.